Indeed, glory may it be to God alone. I thank uh, your pastor for his kind invitation to be with you today. I'm slightly in awe of coming amongst you, uh, but uh, I am assured and have been assured of a warm welcome, and I'm very, very glad indeed. And uh, Christine and I uh, are both uh, uh, deeply committed to the Lord Jesus Christ, the very same Lord uh, that we serve, and uh, we have done so for these many years. We have also uh, given birth to and raised twins. And if you see that I have white hair, you will see the consequences of this. Uh, but uh, that lies ahead of our dear brother and sister. <laughs> Mind you, six children. We only had five. I don't know what got into us. The passage that we're looking at today is from God's Word, from Matthew's Gospel, uh, chapter 5, and it's part of the famous Sermon on the Mount that the Lord Jesus Christ preached. And I believe that uh, at an earlier time you've had a sermon on the first part, on the Beatitudes, as we call them, and now we take up from there uh, at verse uh, uh, 13. As we begin to look at this passage, let us pray for the Lord's blessing. Our Heavenly Father, we do pray that by the power of the same Spirit who wrote your word, we may understand it. We pray that our hearts may be open to it. We pray that we may be transformed by it. We pray that we may indeed always glorify your holy name. And we pray these things for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. Uh, Matthew 5, verse 13, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is good then for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfo underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy but to fulfill. For assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you, that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. This is a confronting passage. I don't like it, but of course I do like it because the Lord Jesus said it. It raises this question for us all, as does the whole Sermon on the Mount. Who am I? Who should I be? I passed a local gym the other day on a walk and it said this outside, come, uh, join us, doing something kind to yourself which will recharge you and make you a better 
lover of those who love you. Do something kind for yourself. A local school bus went by, and on the back of it, there were three tigerish-looking young primary school ladies. And it said underneath, watch us change the world. That's what they're being taught is their business. And they are going to do it. I wish you could see their faces. I looked up uh, what a local university says about itself, and the vice chancellor says, when you graduate, are you ready? When you graduate from this university, you'll be ready to take the lead and advance yourself, either professionally or personally, whatever your passion may be. It doesn't say when you graduate from this university, uh, you'll be able to serve others and to uh, be a better engineer or something like this. It says you'll be ready to take the lead. It doesn't say you'll be a good employee. It says you'll be ready to take the lead and advance yourself. Whatever your passion may be. You see why I'm asking you, living in this world now, who are you? Because we're constantly being told who we can be and who we should be. And if you do as I do for fun, look at the website of uh, schools, you'll find out what your children are expected to be in the world as, 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 that's unfolding. Who are you? Who are you meant to be? Who should you be? Now, here we are this morning, and we have been confronted with words from Jesus. And he has a very different picture of who you are and whether you are capable of changing the world and how that could be done. But it's a picture based on reality. And it's one that has actually changed the world and keeps doing so. So who are you? Now as this passage unfolds, I want to suggest that uh, we look first of all at your person, second your task, third your guide, and fourth your Lord. Those four things. Are you ready? First of all, your person. For that, we need to go and remind ourselves of more of the big picture of the Bible. Of course, you know that your person begins uh, with the rest of us, with Adam and Eve in the garden. You know that uh, this perfect picture was soon absolutely corrupted. You know that on our behalf, thank you very much, Adam and Eve, particularly Adam, who, uh, uh, who was the person who sinned greatest, uh, we rebelled against the kingdom of God. God's rule, God's kingdom, expressed through his word to them. And they pushed his word aside, and they pushed his kingdom aside. And on our behalf, they became, very stupidly, the enemies of God. And that's where we stand as human beings, against God, having thrust his enemy aside. When Matthew's gospel begins, like the other gospels, we hear this message. The kingdom of God, or the kingdom of heaven in, in Matthew's gospel, same thing. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent. In other words, the moment has come for God to overthrow the rebels, to bring the enemies, and, and bring punishment to his enemies. The kingdom has come. The kingdom is at hand. We see the signs of this coming kingdom. We see, first of all, John the Baptist come, prophesied in Scripture, announcing the coming of the kingdom and calling upon men and women to repent. We see Jesus come, baptized by John the Baptist, 
an extraordinary way, but then going into the desert and fronting up with the one who had brought us down in Adam and Eve, namely Satan, and confronting Satan and defeating Satan. A new Adam has come, if you like. We see him doing signs and wonders that bring the crowds around him as the sick are healed, as devils are cast out, as lives are transformed. We see that the conditions for entry into the kingdom of God and thus salvation for Jesus came to save, we see a condition is repentance. Repentance which means a turning away from ourselves and for the wickedness of ourselves and for the self-centeredness of ourselves. Do something kind for yourself, won't you? Turning away from that nonsense and turning towards the living God. Of submitting our lives to him. Of not saying to ourselves, follow your passion, but following Christ's passion. Following Christ's desires, for their true freedom will be found. Not in self, but in Christ. Repent, turn from self, and turn to the service of the living God in and through the Lord Jesus Christ. Repent! And then we see the disciples. We hear of two or three of them, the fishermen. And Jesus called to them, come follow me, and they model repentance by leaving it all behind and coming and following him and making him their teacher and their Lord and their guide. And these disciples model repentance and so then and there enter the kingdom that Jesus is announcing. And so with his disciples and with the great crowds following him, he sits, as teachers did in those days, he sits and teaches them about the kingdom. And that is the Beatitudes, of course. And I don't intend, of course, to go over those, since you have done so already. But simply to say this, that the Beatitudes talk, of course, of those God favours, those God blesses. His enemies? No, no longer. His blessed ones. And if you remember, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. In other words, blessed are those who have cast aside their passions, their self-centeredness, their egocentricity. They've put that aside, and poor in spirit, they've turned in repentance and submitted themselves to the Lord Jesus Christ, mourning for their sins. And thus we have this wonderful picture in the Beatitudes this wonderful picture of the person who follows the Lord Jesus Christ. The portrait, verses 3 to 11, of a kingdom disciple blessed by God. And then in verses 10 to 12, a warning. Oh, yes. For odd as it is, strange as it may seem, extraordinary. But then we're living in a sinful world. Those who do this will be persecuted. We will be unpopular. We will be unpopular. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you, Jesus says, and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. And he says as you go on, living the blessed Christian life, the Beatitudes, living as a, as a person following the Lord Jesus, when the Lord Jesus calls someone to him, he calls someone to him to die. And the you and the world will be at odds with each other. And in this nation, which has Christian heritage and Christian laws in a way, and a Christian, uh, we are becoming more and more understanding that we are unpopular with the world, which has turned its back once more on God. We are unpopular in this world, and Christians will suffer more and more. Just the word, just the, just the jest at our expense, just the joke, just the discrimination, we will suffer more and more as we try to live for Jesus. Are you going to do that, by the way? Because it's far easier not to be a Christian. Far easier to be a Christian here on Sundays, but not during the week. That's, that may be... No. If you are repentant, if you have turned to the Lord, if you are poor in spirit and mourn your sins, then come what may, you will live for him. Notice these things happen on his account. 
not just because you're a sort of upright person or something like this, but they will happen as you follow him, as you are related to him. Jesus is the king. Jesus is the king. But I thought it was the kingdom of God. Isn't there a conflict here? Isn't there a conflict between God, God's kingdom, and this man, Jesus, who comes and talks as though he is the king? What do we make of this? Is there not a conflict between the law of God and now Jesus sitting there giving his great sermon, the Sermon on the Mount? What do we make of this? And we understand this better as we now turn to your task. Your task in verses 13 to 16. You are the salt of the earth, he says. And then if the salt loses its flavour, most unlikely, but it did happen, as salt became diluted or mixed up with something else, how shall it be seasoned? It is good for nothing but to be chucked out. You are the light of the world, he says. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Do they light a lamp and then hide it away? No, the lamp is meant to be shining. What is he saying to them here as disciples of the Lord Jesus? Yes, you will be unpopular. You will want to be silent at work. If you're at school, you will not be a popular teenager if you stand for Jesus. And more and more is that the case. But we must not retreat into our fortress. We must not retire from the world as though, oh, well, we will live in our own little country here or our own little spot there, our own fortress. We'll put up a wall. We'll only mix with Christians. We'll only say things to other Christians. We'll make sure that we don't broadcast our sermons abroad any longer because people troll through them and find things are said. No, no, we are going to cut ourselves off from the world. Is that what we ought to do? Jesus says to you, if you belong to me, you are salt. You are a city set on a hill. We are a city set on a hill. We are the light. He is the light of the world, but we are light because he is the light of the world and he is our saviour. We must be committed to this world. We must be committed to this world, not becoming worldly. No point in being committed. If you're going to become worldly, you're salt that's lost its savour then. If you just become like the world, forget it. But we must be committed to the world because it too is God's world. You must live in such a way that you will do good in this world. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works, he says. What good works? What good works are we meant to be doing? Well, of course, the good works that flow from... <laughs> uh, it's tricky, isn't it? You could think of this in two ways. You could think, well, the good works, okay, well, now let me think. Right, uh, there's a list of good works here. They're like a, it's like a ladder. I will climb the good works, and all the time God is saying to me, well done, well done, well done, and at the end he'll say, well done, because I've done the good works, I've climbed the ladder, I've made the effort, I'm here. Or, and you'll have noticed this, I'm sure, in your ex human experience, there are moments, aren't there, when you enter into a relationship that transforms you and you become a new person. That happens, I guess, when we fall in love. But sometimes it's a friendship. But love transforms us. Even our earthly loves. The love of Jesus Christ the love of Jesus Christ for us and the love with which we respond to him is transformative. We become those who mourn, those who are poor in spirit, those who are meek, those who are peacemakers, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. We become new men, new women, not perfect, of course, far from it, but we become transformed. We exhibit kindness and mercy 
and peace and righteousness. Not as a list of rules, not as a ladder to climb, but as a response to the wonder of the love of God in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what happens to us. And we show this love of God through Jesus Christ in our kindness. And I ask me, I ask myself, is this true of you? Is this a description of you? Is this what has happened to you? Kindness. Are you a person who could be described as generous? Are you a person who could be described as one who cares for the weak, the lonely, the dispossessed, the dying, the elderly? the lonely are you a person of integrity so that in the workplace you may be regarded as an absolute nutter a religious idiot a fool but a person whose word can be trusted a person who does the work inspected of them a person who models honesty and integrity is that who you are because you belong to Jesus and you cannot help but be this this is who you are, this is who you wish to be, and this is who you will be. Is that who you are? It is not an accident, of course, that great works, great works of mercy have been founded again and again by Christian people. <laughs> Just this week, I thought, who founded the Red Cross? Cross, sounds familiar. And if you go and look at the, it was a Christian who founded the Red Cross. Did you know it was a group of Christians who founded the Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals? Yep, it was Christians, William Wilberforce and others. Yesterday I visited a dying friend. And where is she being looked after, I wonder? In St Luke's Hospital. If you begin to look at our nation, if you begin to look at this world, you will see again and again our friends in South Africa. That again and again, great works are being done quietly or publicly in the name of Christ by those who are not seeking to save themselves by doing these good works, but knowing that they are saved, knowing that they have repented, look for and seek to do the good works. But notice there's another little thing here. There's another little, I didn't quote the whole verse. You may have noticed that. Are you ready? Look. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works, yes, and glorify your Father in heaven. It's not as though you are intending to be a really, really wonderful person, a great neighbour, a terrific worker, a person who gets praise everywhere for the wonder of who they are. That'd be ridiculous, wouldn't it? You're not such a great person. When it, well, I didn't know if you knew that. <laughs> You're not going to... No. You are so to do your good works. Look. You are so to do your good works that people will praise your heavenly Father. Integral to this is sharing the gospel for the greatest work you can possibly do is to save those who are perishing, to help the enemies of God to see that there is peace, that they can come to know God through the Lord Jesus Christ, that he laid down his life for them, that there is, after all, a cross in this world. Yes? But in any case, you are not looking for praise. Yes, you are. Yes, that's wrong. You're not looking for praise of self, you're looking for the praise of God that people may praise you. I never forget taking someone to hear one, a great preacher once, a wonderful preacher, and uh, he preached in a very difficult passage in the Bible. And I thought it was difficult. I thought, oh, goodness. And this gentleman came with me to hear this preacher, and this gentleman didn't normally go to church or anything. And uh, at the end of the sermon, he turned to me and he said, that's a great passage in the Bible, isn't it? The preacher was brilliant. He had all the jokes. He had all the flourishes. He was great. He was a great communicator. He was such a great communicator that my friend 
gave glory to God. And we are so to do such great works. The people will be grateful, of course, human beings. Of course they will. But in the end, they must know that anything we do comes from God. Not saying talk about it all the time, <laughs> something like that. But what you want to be known for, what I want to be known for, is that I'm a follower of Jesus. All oh, glory to God. Your task, our greatest task. What about your guide, your guide? What good works are we meant to be doing? And here Jesus turns to the law. The Mosaic law, the law that so dominates so much of the, particularly the early chapters of the Bible, uh, the, um, the great law of God, love God, love your neighbour as yourself, the, the commandments, the statute law, if you like, the Ten Commandments, the uh, case law of, you know, what happens if your ox falls into a ditch and it's the Sabbath day, what are you supposed to do and all that other stuff. There's a large amount of law in those early chapters and they dominate uh, much of the Bible. And so Jesus turns us to the law. Don't think I've come to destroy the law of the prophets. I didn't come to destroy, but to fulfill. Why on earth would he say such a thing? Well, you must remember that he's speaking in a strongly biblical community. They knew their Bible. Can I say that they were, they were the evangelicals of the day, shall we say. <laughs> they knew their Bible. And he speaks of the scribes, the, that was the lawyers, the people who, not lawyers quite in our sense, but the, but the interpreters of the sacred word, the, the interpreters, they knew the law. He speaks of the Pharisees, the Pharisees were lay people, but they were um, six or seven thousand of them, they were the keepers of the law. They, they believed in the extraordinary importance of keeping the law, and they lived it out. A bit ostentatiously, if I may say so, but they lived out keeping the law. And uh, you may say, well, Pharisees, it's a, you know, the awful people. No, you've got to understand that they were greatly admired. People felt they were, the, they were the top people of the day. They were the ones who, were, who actually kept God's law, thank God. So they were greatly admired in their own day. I mean, they were so scrupulous they did treat the law as if it was a group of rules to be kept and they analysed it carefully with the help of the scribes in order to make sure they were doing everything right. They went beyond the law to make sure that they didn't break the law. That's how, you know, in a, in a, they, when they were driving along the expressway, they never drove at 110, they always drove at 100. So they never went over. Uh, that's a sort of... Yeah, you understand they didn't, you understand that, okay. But it's, they were that sort of Pharisee, that sort of person. Now Jesus is not popular with the Pharisees. Is it because he's attacking the Bible? Is it because Jesus is someone who's setting the law aside? Is Jesus bringing in his own laws here? Best of the poor in spirit, is this a whole new set of laws? Is he a new Moses who says, the old Moses is gone, now you've got to follow me? The Pharisees, the people, would not have been happy about this. They were Bible people. Is he putting the Bible aside? And so in verse 17 to 19, and to 20, he completely endorses the law, does he not? I've come, haven't come to destroy the law and the prophets, that's the whole Old Testament he's talking about there, or what we call the Old Testament, the Bible as it was in those days. For assuredly I say to you, heaven and earth pass away. When God's kingdom comes in all its glory, one jot, one tittle, the little, little uh, punctuation signs will not pass from the law till all is fulfilled. If you break the law, you are least in the kingdom. If you said to others, you don't have to keep... Is that good enough, Pharisees? Have you heard me? I am a Bible man through and through, says Jesus. But yet there are two strange things. Have you noticed them? Two oddities here. Ready? First of all, 
I haven't come to destroy the law and the prophets. I didn't come to destroy it, but to obey it. No, he doesn't say obey it. He says fulfill it. And then he talks in the next verse about till all is fulfilled. Yeah. Okay, I've come to fulfill the law. You are reading the book, Pharisees, as a rule book, as a gain entrance into the kingdom of God because I'm a good person book. You're reading it, Pharisees, and living it out in a way that people look at you and praise you for the way in which you're living, Pharisees. You think by keeping the law, God will be happy with you and approve you. You'll be good enough. You don't understand the law and the prophets, he says. For the law and the prophets is, first of all, not a command book. It's a promise book. It contains the great promises of God for what God is going to do when the kingdom comes and who he is going to do it through. And it's a portrait book. It gives us a portrait of the Messiah yet to come. Well, they thought yet to come. We know better. This book, the Law and the Prophets, is a, is a portrait book. It's a promise book. Yes, of course it contains the laws of God, the demands of God upon us. Of course it does. But preeminently it is a book about the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, the dynamic of God saving people, redeeming them, bringing them home. It's a dynamic of a God who addresses a human race that cannot keep the law. Did you not know that? Pharisees. And so he is making a gigantic claim here to be the fulfillment of the promises of God, to be the one who is the subject of the portrait painted by God. Let me give an example. So that, for example, right near them there is the temple of the Lord, yes, which had been built under the law of God, yes, rightly so, and where sacrifices were and that sort of thing. And Jesus once said, I am the temple. You don't worry about the temple in Jerusalem any longer for I am the temple. I am the meeting place of God and man. I am the one whose sacrifice on the cross does away with all animal sacrifices which cannot take away sin. But my sacrifice, my death on the cross is where condemnation is taken, where forgiveness ensues you see i fulfill the law not that i'm putting the law aside the law gives us the portrait which i fulfill and you keep the law so you can see the portrait no one is saying set aside the law and the prophets not at all but you've got to understand them correctly not as steps into the kingdom but steps when you have received the kingdom if i put it like that and so he says in this second absolutely astonishing thing, have you seen it? Verse 20, doesn't that frighten you? Have a look. Doesn't that make you, it should. Maybe you think Pharisees were rather nasty people. No, 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 they, remember, they were, they, were, they were top of the range. They kept the law. But notice what it says here. Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the law of the scribes and the Pharisees, are you better than the scribes and the Pharisees? Is that you? Well, Jesus says, you won't even enter the kingdom unless you are. What on earth does he mean? Well, he did say, didn't he? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. He did say, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. He did say, it's not the moralists who enter the kingdom of God, it's the broken. He did say, didn't he, and we're reminded vividly of this this morning with this lovely dedication. He did say to the children that they are part of the kingdom. For you enter the kingdom not as a proud person, full of arrogance that you have kept the law. You enter the kingdom as a broken person, knowing that you have not kept the law. That fundamentally you need to repent. 
mourning your sins in order to receive the comfort. For Jesus said, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will refresh you. Learn from me. Learn from me, he said. Make me the center of your life. And in that way, you will exceed the false righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. Don't be nasty about them. Just recognize that your way in has been the way of recognition that nothing in my hand I bring simply to thy cross. I cling. And so we come to the Lord. And by the way, what we're talking about here is the Reformation. <laughs> the rediscovery of the Bible and the Reformation. The rediscovery that the Reformation, the Bible alone, yes. Christ alone, yes. Grace alone, yes. By faith alone, yes. And all to the glory of God alone. And we see that here. And so we see our Lord. And so in the, uh, in the final here, he says, all these things will remain. I've come to fulfill them. And I have fulfilled, I do fulfill them. And then he explains the law. And uh, this, of course, is very famous. I'm not going to go through it now. But you've heard it said of men of old, you shall not murder. Whoever murders will be in, in danger of judgment. Well, that law has not been repealed. I would ask you not to murder anyone. Certainly true. But Jesus says, no, I say to you, I am the Lord and I fulfill the law. Now, I am going to say to you, don't even be angry because murder begins with anger. You will be in danger of judgment. If you do, he says, you've heard it said, don't commit adultery. I say to you, do not lust, for adultery begins with lust. The law cannot reach into the heart of a person. Only the word of God, the word of Christ, can go to the heart of the person and transform us as we hear these words and recognize first our own deep sinfulness our need of a saviour. Blessed are those who are mourn, who are poor in spirit. But then what he's asking of us. And he ends by saying, be perfect. <laughs> be perfect. Your righteousness exceeds that of the law, the scribes and Pharisees. In the first place, because you understand what the law demands. And secondly, because as you walk with Jesus... As you walk with Jesus, you never get to the perfection of the end until the end. But nonetheless, step by step, your life is transformed as he deals with your inner sins. Bringing them to the cross of Christ. Receiving forgiveness. And receiving by the power of the Holy Spirit. The capacity to live for Jesus. And do the good works which will point not to yourself but to him. It's impossible to keep the law as a path to salvation. Absolutely impossible, particularly if you define the law like this in its truth. Only Jesus ever did it. It's impossible. But he did, and he brought out the real meaning of it and said to us, much of the law now is a testimony to me. You can... Eat pork if you like, which is really good news. I love that. <laughs> you don't have to go to the temple. It's not that this law is now... No, it's still there in the Bible. It still points to Jesus. It's still part of the portrait of Jesus. He's not setting it aside. He's bringing out its true meaning, do you see? He's bringing out its true meaning. And he says, when you confront the reality of the law, you realize your own sinfulness and your own need for grace forgiveness and then you can begin the task which will go on until you go home of being changed from one degree of glory to another by the Lord who is the spirit and so who are you
Come on, fair dinkum. Stop mucking around. Who are you? Are you persuaded by this law's rhetoric, this world's rhetoric? We are going to change the world. If you get a degree at this rather strange university, you will be a leader. And you will follow your passion, even if the boss asks you to do something else. After all, you are a graduate of our university. You know best. Is that you? Or are you a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, saved by grace, conscious of sin, mourning sin, but comforted through the Lord Jesus and through his death for you on the cross, and now transformed by him by the power of his Holy Spirit, walking with him as he changes you into the shape of into what the law really says here, into the, into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. Who are you? The only way, brothers and sisters, is to be a follower of Jesus. He's our only hope. No one else. Because he loved you and gave his life for you. And you have forgiveness through him. And he will take you, even you. And he will use you for his purposes in this world. And keep you through ever unpopularity comes your way or even persecution use you to be a light to the world and salt in a world that desperately needs our help let's pray our father in heaven we thank you for your word we thank you for the lord jesus who spoke your word and who lived your word who fulfilled your word and we pray now heavenly father that you would grant to us your Holy Spirit, so that we may be changed from one degree of glory to another as we live for Jesus in this world. And we pray for these mercies, Heavenly Father, in the name of our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.